Yes. Okay. Um, so thanks everyone for joining today. Um, first up, just in a, in a quick intro to try and link some of these kind of different initiatives together. Um, we will have a submissions in our um, our adoption series event coming. I think last time I mentioned this, um, but we didn't have a date. Now it looks like uh, July 13th is going to be the date for that. Um, if you follow the link or go to the Our Consortium webpage and uh, click on webinars, which is in one of the tabs at the top, you'll get there. It still says something along the lines of it's coming soon. The details aren't there yet. Um, but you will also notice a revamp of that web page. So if you want to have a look at some of the previous webinars in the R Adoption series, they're nicely organized now. Um, uh, it's much, much easier to go and get to that historical content. So that will appear soon. Um, so nothing much has changed other than the diary. So if you keep that date for your diary um, and uh, yeah, we should have a very interesting um, session there. We've got some confirmed speakers from the FDA, um, but that will be confirmed in the, um, in the details for the webinar. Okay, um, today uh, we have uh, Johannes and uh, Julian. Um, so uh, finally get to Julian after you've organized all of these other presenters um, from, from everywhere else for this um, series. Um, so looking forward to these two. And then we've got a, so uh, just the two talks today and then we've got the Q and A um, uh, panel discussion with the presenters. Uh, it won't be, I'm not sure what times add up, but um, it, it, it probably should be just under the full hour I expect um, and having said that no doubt we'll have tons and tons of questions and we'll go run for the full hour um, but we are one um, one talk fewer than uh, than we've had um, previously so hopefully there's plenty of time for everyone um, okay uh, I haven't seen is so is Johannes on and am I pronouncing your name correctly I haven't seen him yet okay um, then it might be even shorter, but um, I guess there's a quick, um, quick switch around. Um, Julian, are you able to go first? And I will try and, given that you'll be presenting, I will try and pin your hands in the background. Yes, uh, and you should have his email and contact, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll do that and uh, I'll just stop sharing my video now and let you okay. share. Um... So I hope you all see my screen right now. Yes. Yes. That's useful. And you hear me as well, obviously. So that's very useful as well. So combining these two things, uh, thanks a lot for diving in. And um, the third part of the case series, um, I'm presenting um, the how we implement a risk-based assessment of our packages at Merck KGAA or EMD Serono, how it's called in the US. And um, there are some collaborators um, so um, uh, that uh, helped implementing that uh, in the company and one is also signed in today. So uh, thanks Stefan for coming despite vacation time. Um, so um, there's an abstract that was just for our farmer. Um, so I'm basically using the slide again. And just as a reminder, this is why we are doing this, just why we are needing all this uh, validation um, as establishing the documented evidence, which provides the high degree of assurance, a uh, specific process consistently and produces a product meeting pre of predetermined specification and quality attributes. So that comes from the FDA. And uh, this particular talk focuses on the accuracy of our packages. Um, should drop that and, um, and how we implement or how we interpret that uh, what the, our validation hub obviously has nicely uh, prepared um, in our company and Merck. Um, why it is focused here on R for obvious reasons. Um, the idea is to keep the framework general enough to also be able to generalize it to other programming languages, um, Python and then SAS, practically probably not uh, that is so more focused on R here. So uh, the very general framework is uh, something that we have seen similar also in previous uh, discussions that we differentiate packages or we try to find a process that classifies packages into three levels of confidence. Um, so um, 
the for Merck, these three levels of confidence is the first level is the core grant packages, just the, uh, the base packages and the recommended packages. And uh, as we all know and have discussed uh, quite uh, extensively, these uh, have minimal risk in the documentation that the R consortium has provided. And um, then we have the Merck add-on standard packages where we assume uh, where we uh, develop a framework that we say there's documented, there's enough documented evidence that we can trust these packages as standard packages. So we recommend them to you be used for our standard analysis and we assume um, they're of, um, I put that, good enough quality to produce the results that we expect to see. And then we have all the other packages, which doesn't mean that we can't use them, but it would be more user uh, input required to ensure the proper quality of the analysis output specifically. So um, we are trying to basically differentiate the, the huge group of contributed packages into two groups, the Merck add-on standard packages and other R packages. Having said that, there's sort of an algorithm that is mostly uh, automated um, um, to summarize if a package goes into that level two of the, or that level three of the general package. So after the installation qualification is succeed, successful with uh, the execution of available tests, we would, uh, the idea is to make the package directly available to the end user. Um, so we are basically in this upper part. If not, we obviously uh, try attempt to resolve the package issues and we directly have it in the in level three as available. And then it may take, and that's the immediate thing. So we don't have to wait until the entire process is executed. So um, we try to make the time of request until availability, availability as short as possible. And then after availability, uh, basically, the user can use it and the assessment whether that packet becomes uh, of higher standard um, is executed and that would be by two uh, has two dimensions one is the test coverage and the second dimension is the risk metric score so uh, having a test coverage over 50 and because more test coverage is better um, and uh, having a risk metric score below 50 because less risk is better. And uh, if that is fulfilled, uh, the package uh, pretty much automatically gets promoted to level two, uh, two. So we have a high confidence of package accuracy. Otherwise, there is a more manual version of a explicit risk assessment um, that uh, the package can go through in order to um, still be promoted to level two. So we are trying to keep, keep the process as smooth uh, as possible. Looking into the risk metric score, we had the test uh, coverage and here the test coverage comes in again as 50%, 15% of software development practices such as maintain a public code base and news file, 15% bug resolution URL and status. So downloads of community usage, usability metrics, documentation, help and vignette you see that all these components are basically from the risk metric package provided by the R validation map. And um, we also know that these risk metric components are not independent um, metrics from a statistical point of view, means uh, a good package may have good results in all of these things. Um, and uh, then together we create an overall sc a score that is helping to understand whether a package is robust or not. Having said that, uh, I'm a trained statistician, so I couldn't help myself to actually use uh, uh, statistical classification methods to find a good cutoff, what is a good cutoff to create a robust score. And um, the st statistical approach would be an ROC analysis um, that basically tries to find that optimal threshold of what plus a package classification given that continuous risk uh, score. And that was being found um, to, uh, to uh, satisfy sensitivity and uh, specificity requirements at 50. So this number just does not fall from the sky, but it is actually a data-driven um, uh, 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 number. And um, 
in future developments that can be obviously uh, used and adapted. Um, we use that for training data of uh, 61 manually evaluated R packages and obtained an overall accuracy of 77%. So that's not too bad. And uh, at the same time, we also have that second dimension of test coverage and could altogether get a classification specificity of 88.5%. So saying that we are mostly automating it and still gives us a little bit of confidence that we are doing a decent enough job. Having said that, there obviously for each um, statistical model that you develop, you want to have some test and some training data. So in the next step, we are going to have some test step um, to verify that that empirical evaluation holds for independent uh, test set. And obviously that's why we are here. We are very happy to seek feedback because uh, rather have the feedback earlier from the community than later uh, when we are uh, speaking with agencies. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Julianne. Let me switch my video back on. So um, I'm just having a look at the attendee list. I think we are still waiting, potentially. I haven't had an email response yet. So um, let's go with Q&A um, to keep things moving now. Um, and um, no, no pressure, but now all the Q&A is on <laughs> specifically what you're doing. Um, Julian, I, I'll start things off um, with a with a question. If anyone else anyone else has questions, um, please post um, in the chat. Um, if if you do, um, my question is around. So you've got the, the two thresholds. Um, we get this all the time with things like risk metric. But what to what extent do you think that's open to abuse um, by? package authors and is that a realistic concern um i mean someone i think it's more like a motivation for package authors um to actually get their packages to a higher quality because i mean i don't know um so you asked me now as a package author i think it's a good motivation to have like a package that was developed years 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 ago when different standards were good to go and I think it's good to rebrush um, old packages with, a, with some of the things that have not been standard back then. And I think I see it as a motivation. Um, how much criminal energy do you need in order to have those thresholds available? And then you are still going and re-evaluating re those thresholds. So saying that like that's, that's it's still a the GXP environments are still sort of separated from other things, and I think um, it's very unlikely that something gets through. And like, what would be the motivation to try to get through a package that it's it's something that I don't really know how. Well, to maybe do. maybe if we look at it from a less sinister perspective, what what about if someone has um, a package? I, there's a popular package that I don't want to name. <laughs> I don't want to drop the author in it, but let's say that you have an, a package with a lot of um, sort of miscellaneous functions in it um, that do lots of different things. You're not necessarily intending to use the functions. You're not going to use all the functions. You have an idea of what you want to use that package for. Um, a package might have 50, 60, 70 percent coverage, but they might not cover any of the things that you're using. Is there mm -hmm. a concern about what is being tested in the package? Um, so we wouldn't go down to actually see whether the specific function that we are interested in is tested in the automated way. That could be something that could be looked at in the explicit way, let's say more the other way around that the package has 30% coverage. I just want to use this one particular function and that one is covered so you could catch that in the explicit assessment and still be able to use it as a user. Um, Yes, I uh, absolutely hear your concern of having a package that may not explicitly cover the, the function, but at the same time, we are all 
when we are doing the analysis, we also expect all users to be qualified and that's the FDA requirement as well. So blindly using analysis tools is maybe a bad idea in any way. So we are just doing a risk assessment. We cannot fully avoid any risk anywhere, anytime. Thank you. Um, Joe had put a question in the chat. And Joe, since you've got a video on, do you want to ask the question directly? Yes. Do, do you expect uh, any kind of thrashing for some packages, like passing criteria and failing and then passing, especially since it, you apparently have a semi-automated um, system? Um, I... So I think also what I heard from other presentations is it we had like last time we had the question like if some package doesn't pass, how do you deal with it? And other companies have been saying like, okay, whoever has requested the package, are they willing to write additional tests to make it pass? And you get a little bit of how much does the person actually need the package? Um, and oftentimes people just withdraw their request. Um, that's what I heard. I, I don't remember who it was and I don't want to paraphrase wrongly. Um, but I think that's a, probably a reasonable way of going with it. Um, yeah. So um, other people have been on the line from last time. I see other people's names. So please feel uh, free to speak up and join because there's some new interesting questions to make it more interesting for everyone as well. That's Yeah, that's a good point, actually. If other, other people who have previously presented want to chip in, yeah, absolutely. Um, please do. I think, Ellis, I know you weren't able to join last time and are here as well. Um, so hello. Um, and Ellis, you've asked a question, but the, before you, um, Stephen got in a question. Um, so on the face of it, Steve, so Stephen's asking a question about the number of um, downloads and how you get that. So that comes from risk metric. Um, but I guess you can extend that question and say, well, risk metric gives you a number of downloads and from that it generates a, a, a score. Um, I, I suppose this is similar to my last question you done around the testing, but like for everybody, now we've got some more faces online, when you get a single score, how much do you think you can rely on that, like that single score? Because that's just saying that here's a high number of downloads. But if you have a very niche statistical package, it's going to have a low number of downloads, for example. doesn't mean it's any less um, good. But I, but I guess what I'm trying to say is the context of number of downloads or some of those other metrics, like how long a package has been around for, like that... Uh, I mean, how long a package for, has been around for is always probably going to be a positive thing. But like um, you could weigh that against like tests, for example, something that has um, fewer tests but has been around for 20 years, then that's probably still OK. So if you're just relying on a, on a score, you're not able to um, maybe pick out those nuances. Is that a problem? Has, has it been a problem or, and do you foresee it as a problem? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the considerations that we 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 had in mind when we were actually developing our own processes at uh, Mark. Um, and so it's um, the one at Mark that actually rely directly on the number of downloads. It does take it into consideration, but it's not weighted as in the risk metric approach. So that's one way. But again, I think the next series where we actually get to ask the FDA regulators some questions about the whole um, quality as well as the assessment that they deem, what is the risks that they deem, would be a good insight into you know, how we can you know, modify our approaches as well. Funny enough, it was raised by someone at the FDA in one of our early um, our validation hub meetings. The number of downloads could be like the most important <laughs> metric, something along the lines of surely if ever, if something has been downloaded a lot of times, is do we need much more than that? Um, so yeah, I think I agree that will be a very interesting um, uh, discussion. Um, obviously, that comment as well, by the way, was put in the context of I do not speak for the FDA, as as normally is the case in these these things. Um, Ellis, you asked a question. Uh, does your approach take into yeah. account the business case? You're, do you want to, since you're on camera as well? <laughs> do you want to yeah, sure. Yeah. So basically, uh, Julianne, I was asking, uh, how do you take into account cases where the, the use case of the package or the way, the way that's intended to be used isn't a high risk situation, such as it's just doing formatting 
or um, very simple data manipulation where it's very easy to see that there is something happening that's incorrect. Uh, so you can catch those uh, versus a pa uh, like if you have a situation like that, but the package itself assesses using risk metric to actually be fairly risky. Like it doesn't think the test coverage is high enough or hasn't closed enough bugs in the last 30 days or something like that. How do you balance those two? Um, so there's basically a package that wouldn't like go into the standard Merck library, like the standard add-on package would be still be made available. And that means the user would have to put more work in. And that obviously depends on the task that you're trying to accomplish. So there's this whole quality assurance SOP thingy um, that it's still like, how complex is the analysis? What is the purpose of the analysis that tries to balance out how much uh, quality control I need to do for my code. And um, I think just setting up that risk assessment for our packages in that particular context makes a lot of sense and aligning it with that. Um, Pritam, do you want to ask your general question? Yeah, this is to all the authors and presenters who are here. Um, we've been trying to get, um, you know, the uh, the term trusted um, being accepted by our QA teams. And so the, the, the general questions we had is what, what are the actual qualification requirements that you would um, you know, designate a particular uh, organization or a vendor uh, uh, that uh, authors some R packages as trusted um, so that they can be qualified without further um, user testing. So the quickest example I can mention is that we were trying to qualify RSTAN as an organization, as a trusted vendor. Um, and, um, you know, we were having so many difficulties with respect to how do we actually quantify it in terms of, um, you know, quantifiable requirements? How do you actually make someone a trusted source? So, oh, Joe, are you waving to, you want to come in on that question? feel strongly about this. So trust, just like trust anywhere, is something that's earned over time, right? So I think you have to treat them like everybody else in the beginning and then see how they pass packages over time. I mean, you might start with a prior and say that it's trusted uh, and, and that would be fine. So Bayesian thinking is good here. Um, speaking of Stan, but then you got to build trust over time. And I think that's the strongest track record. I think, I, well, so I'm going to let, uh, oh, Gina, you get a hand up actually, you go. Um, yeah, trust is built over time. I like the basin thinking of it, but uh, you can obviously help the trust building by uh, publishing. Uh, Stan has, for instance, published uh, a little bit of insights about their software, and de software development cycles. And I think that really helps to establish uh, I'll accelerate the trust building cycle. Let's put it like that. Yeah, I mean, for certain closed source softwares that we might use in this industry, um, we're not necessarily all going in and auditing, so that trust is built up over time in most cases as well. So I, I would agree. And in fact, in the white paper, we said something very much along those lines: is that over time, anything can become trusted. If you if you pass the same package for five years in a row, or for the same like five packages all by the same author or company um, and you're always passing their stuff and they're always scoring really highly on whether it's you whether you're using risk metric and test coverage or using another mechanism within your company if you're always thinking that they're they're fine then over time yeah you build up that trust that's fine i think what we're also seeing though is some companies are looking okay is there something we can say today like the r foundation we haven't evaluated the r foundation over a long period of time but they've existed for a long period of time they've produced r over a long period of time they have their software development life cycle. Our studio is another. Um, Stan, you just mentioned they all, and what, the one thing in common, they all have the software development life cycle. And uh, we've talked about that as a committee that maybe that's a really important document. I guess then it's showing that you actually adhere to that cycle is the, is the next most important thing. Because that's essentially, if you're getting audited, it's here's what my quality process is. And then you have to show in the audit that you adhere to that process. So first of all, someone can have a look at that and make sure they're happy with the process. Secondly, build up some evidence that someone follows that SDLC. Ellis, I'd love you to come back in because I know you, you've written up one of these kind of documents internally at GSK. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I mean, you basically kind of spoke to what I was I was going to say, where you can work to identify what is their SDLC and create a basically do an audit uh, an audit. There we go of the company or of like our stand, for example, uh, the example uh, in the package you were talking about, and show that they have consistently done this over a number of years and and basically write your documentation to that without actually like, performing your audit like going to that company or going to that author, but try to provide evidence to show they said this is the SDLC they follow. Here's evidence to show that they actually do this. And this is why I trust it in combination with the other things that you look at for package assessment as well. Um, like looking at downloads, looking at, uh, you know, how well do they consistently test their packages? Um, do they, do you have concerns about them like getting dropped off a crayon or anything like that? So, basically creating a body of evidence. I don't think there's any one thing that you should worry about worry about in particular, but it's creating that um, combined set of evidence to show that you can trust it. And just to chime in on that, <clears throat> I feel like that by nature, the trusted resource assessment is less tied to the specific packages and the specific versions. So that's like having that history is really important to understand the trajectory and feel like your trust in them can really stand the test of time. It's going to continue. Um, and you don't have to worry so much about what's going to happen with the specifics of the packages and the versions and all of that. Any thoughts on like how you know, with these trusted assessments, you, if someone becomes trusted, is there any way for someone to become untrusted? I guess you can get married and you can get divorced. So like what what mechanisms are companies putting in, in place? Sorry for the analogy. But what, what mechanisms are people putting in place to monitor? I guess are you people looking back in five years time and saying, OK, do we still trust this vendor? Um, or is it like a once I trust, I trust forever? Or has that, are we too are we too early to even decide? Um, I mean, this is one of the questions that was raised by a QA team when we were doing this audit, and um, they did suggest uh, periodic assessments that could be um, put in place so that all the vendors or at least the trusted sources can be periodically assessed um, on a time frame that is suitable to all. So it could be two years or three years, but something that can be put in place so that when an actual regulatory audit occurs, you have the evidence to back up your so, um, your claims as well. So um, if you, if trusted was, um, let's say part of the risk assessment um, criteria, so it's trusted or not, right? But it could be built on, a, on a keeping a track of how they're trusted or not. So you could have a, you could build a lag in there. So what happens is, is you've got sort of like a time series. Have you been trusted over the last five uh, packages or over the last 10 assessments? So that would automatically have a mechanism for if not disqualifying a person from being trusted or a company from being trusted, would, would it flag you to look into what's going on? So I think that what I'm, I guess what I'm all really trying to say here, tr the trusted flag is conditional on past history uh, of, of going back some time. So I think the system could easily accommodate conditional, uh, conditional metrics. Okay. Um, any other, there's no other questions in the chat. Um, this is, as many questions as we were going to ask for sort of Julian's talk alone. Johannes has confirmed uh, due to personal reasons, uh, Johannes will join us. Um, so um, what I would propose is if there are any other questions, what a, it's a great opportunity to ask any or any questions as you said earlier, Julian, to any author, uh, sorry, any um, person who's presented thus far. Um, it's actually quite a nice open debate at the moment around some of these topics. If not, um, I'll just take up maybe five minutes, well, five minutes more of your time to just kind of round off a couple of things to talk about what, what we're doing next in terms of the write-up of some of these and, and the plans moving forward. Julian. I just want to also invite everyone to continue the discussion on GitHub and uh, 
if anything comes up, I think it's a good place to continue and also to learn from each other, um, to um, use that space and continue using that space and upload your presentations or files um, into the case studies, um, because I think it's very valuable and also helps to get feedback before you get the feedback at the one time when you don't need it anymore, when you don't want it anymore. Let's put it like that. Um, you always want feedback, I suppose. Um, yes, uh, good place, good opportunity for you to waterproof um, your frameworks. Thank you for everyone's contribution. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and that's that's maybe I would have taken three minutes to say the same <laughs> the same thing, um, and yeah, and you were much quicker. So um, you shaved off some time for everybody. Um, so yeah, please do have a look at the get um, get in, get onto GitHub. And those people who haven't written in it written anything up yet. I know you have to get permission within companies and so on, but it'd be great to see some more examples on there. A couple of the ones that are up there already are fantastic. Um, really, really nice documents to refer to, especially for those people who will be joining this or watching this video back um, and saying, uh, right, how do I get um, started? How do I talk to my own QA teams? That inf Having that information there as well as these videos obviously is, is, is fantastic. So um, thanks, Julian, for posting it into the chat as well. Uh, and thank you, Julian, for, for coordinating these. Um, this was originally going to be one um, one session. It's turned into three because we had so many people step forward. So that's been fantastic. Um, it may yet be four or five, depending on how many more people come forward. Um, so um, uh, yeah, for now we for now we'll pause. For now, it'd be great to get some more um, input into the uh, on the GitHub side. Um, otherwise, thank you, everybody, and um, we will be back in touch um, in the near future with the next uh, next follow up and um, keep make sure you sit on the list so that you get all of the uh, blog posts and other updates from the um, from the group as well. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, enjoy 20 minutes to so back in your day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.